Well, as I have been sick, I've had some extra time, so I've uh, tried, tried to work on my articulation in my diction, and so I've been trying to talk with marbles in my mouth to help me <laughs> to, to <laughs> hopefully successfully talk about the words I want to use. A couple of weeks ago, by the way, um, I used a word that came out as a different word, and it was problematic. So Michael helped to, to clear that up. Thank you, Michael, for the last couple of weeks, by the way. And so I'm trying to get better on that. And also, as I've been sick, I've been, you know, watching cat videos. And so to help, <laughs> to help my love for cats. And so much so, I decided to drive around the neighborhood with this on the back of my <laughs> car. It says, cat lives matter. <laughs> and um, actually, <laughs> like three weeks ago, someone put this on the back of my vehicle. And I thought <laughs> that was absolutely hilarious. I didn't realize this for a couple days. So, <laughs> Yeah, so I'm trying to, trying to grow in my love for cats. I love people who love cats, and I pray that the cats will love you as much as you love them. <laughs> no, but, you know, pets are great. I'm grateful for them, and uh, I thought that was super hilarious. So, touche, well done, well done. And, of course, uh, this season we're moving into, for some of us, the um, most desirable season of the year football season. <laughs> you were thinking fall. I like fall as well, but hey, I, I, I do like football, so I hope that turns out well and uh, we can enjoy ourselves. Well, the favorite day, by the way, of mine of the week is Sundays, and I am grateful to be worshiping here. Last week, we tried to just slip in. I didn't know if I was contagious or not, and the reason was that I just wanted to worship Christ with you and to hear your voices, and so grateful for your voice, so grateful for your life, and so grateful that we can come together, hear songs like the choir brought to us this morning, like our worship team brought to us this morning, because Christ is worthy of all our praise. And so we again are returning to the Gospel of John. And so if you do have a Bible, go ahead and turn open to John chapter 10. And if you didn't bring your Bible with you, you don't have it on your phone, we do have new pew Bibles right in front of you. It's going to be on page 922. You can open up to that page, John chapter 10. And we're just going to back up just a couple verses to tie together from last week to this week as we finish out this chapter. Now, if you have been with us and if you know um, the Gospel of John, John is writing for a specific purpose. His perfect purpose is to show us Jesus Christ so that we would believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God. And that we would put our faith in him, that we would believe in him and have life in his name. And as we read the Gospel of John, I want you to pay um, careful attention to who Jesus is. John, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, continues to bring forward teaching and miracles and interactions that bring to the surface who Jesus is. And today, I want us, regardless if you're a seeker, a non-believer, or if you are a believer, to think again about Jesus' claims, what he said about himself, and why that matters to you. My hope is, if you are considering Christ, that you would put your faith in him today. And my hope is that if you say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that you will draw close to your Savior, who is the Good Shepherd. Now, when Jesus was on the scene, there was great debate about his identity. Again, we'll see this come to the surface through the Gospel of John. And last week, our passage concluded with those who were listening to him, those who observed his miracles, could see the uh, passion in his eyes. They debated about his identity, and they came down to basically one of two conclusions. Either, yes, indeed, this is 
the Son of God, the Messiah, or the other choice was, well, this man is a madman and possessed by a demon. Now, let's read this, and then we're going to tie into the next passage this morning. This is John 10, starting with verse 19. Michael highlighted it last week, but I want to remind us about what's going on in the life of, of those who live there so that we can put our mind around these things as well. So this is John 10, starting with verse 19 in the NIV version. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he's demon-possessed, and he is raving mad. Why should we listen to this guy? Why should we listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. And can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And Jesus had been performing miracles. So this debate about his identity occurred when he was physically present. And the truth is, the debate about Christ's identity continues to this day. His identity matters because who he is matters. All scripture, Old Testament, New Testament points to Christ. All creation itself points to a creator. And the things that Jesus did, the things that Jesus said matters. And you and I, being exposed to his teaching have to make a determination for ourselves. This is faith that we claim, not faith of our grandmother, our grandfather, or our parents, or our sibling, but who do you say that he is? And the implications are eternal. They're significant and it makes a difference. So the Apostle John, as he is writing these things, again being inspired by the Holy Spirit, concludes that section where Jesus says he is the good shepherd. He is the owner of the sheep. He is the very gate. He is the one who lays down his life and takes it up again. That those who believe in him will receive life and abundantly. He just said all of these astounding things. And those who have ears will hear, those who are of his sheep pasture, those who are of his will come to him, and those who are not will not. These, again, are significant statements. Now, John then fast forwards a couple of months into a, another festival where we see this connection to what Jesus was saying about himself as the good shepherd. Let's pick up in verse 22, John chapter 10. It says, Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. By the way, this is what is commonly known now as Hanukkah, okay? Around Christmas time, winter Hanukkah, they were celebrating the um, setting aside and restoration of the temple for worship. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, verse 23. And Jesus was in the temple courts, walking in Solomon's colonnade. This was an area outside of the temple. Verse 24. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, hey, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Now, I want to point out that this was not a group of seekers, okay? This was not a group of people that had tambourines in their back pocket ready to praise and worship him if he said he was the Messiah, This group 
already determined that he wasn't the Messiah. And so they just wanted him to declare it in a public way in that forum so they can go into their pockets, take out their fist-side stones, and kill the man. Okay? This is the context which this question was asked. The Jews who already determined that they were going to kill him, they saw him in Jerusalem and said, ah, this could be our opportunity. Hey, hey, Jesus, just say it really, really plainly that you're the Messiah. Please, please tell us, right? Please tell us, right? They weren't looking for truth. They were looking to plainly kill him. So Jesus being confronted by this group of people, we have to ask, how will he respond to this questioning of his identity, which indeed was the right question. Now, here's a point I want us to remember, and by the way, there are notes for you. You can follow along. They're online. You can please take them home. Take a look at them. These words are for us. This is the first point I want us to think about, and this is how Jesus responds. Number one, Jesus has his sheep. Okay, let's unpack that a moment. So being asked, Jesus, are you the Messiah? Tell us plainly. This is how he responded in verse 25. Jesus answered, I did tell you, and he did tell them. But you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name, they testify about me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. The truth is that some people are Jesus' sheep and some people are not. The tragic reality is that not everyone ends up in the eternal kingdom of heaven. Popular books will say, well, it doesn't matter who you believe, what you follow, because all roads lead to the same place. Not true according to Jesus. You are either his sheep or you are not. Well, how do you know? Well, those who hear the words of Jesus and believe are his sheep. Do you understand that? Those who hear, and this is what Jesus said in the last section, and he'll say it again in this section, those who hear his voice and believe are his sheep. Those also who look at his works, which is recorded in Scripture, and we see even in our day and transformed lives and miracles that take place by His Spirit, these works testify to the identity of who Jesus is, pointing us to believe, and those who believe are His sheep. Now, some people will not believe regardless of the evidence. You can present thing after thing and reason after reason and teaching of his after teaching of his and they will not believe. I've had experiences and still have experiences of this. Regardless of what is presented, some people will not believe. Even in bringing, well, let's talk about his healing of Those who are blind from birth, let's talk about the walking on water. Let's talk about these miracles of creation and recreation. Let's talk about him knowing the future and prophesying his death. Hey, let's talk about his resurrection from the dead and what came to be. 
Some people, regardless of what is presented to them, and even if Jesus Christ showed up to talk to them, would refuse to believe. Why is this the case? Jesus says that you do not believe because you are not my sheep. So how then do we know who are his sheep? Again, they believe. We proclaim the gospel to everyone everywhere, and we can say amen to that. And those who have ears, hear, but we do not determine this. The good shepherd speaks and knows who he calls. And hear, respond. These folks in his day and some people In our day, they don't want to hear. Now, Jesus connects this response and continues in verse 27. First, talking about them who did not believe, and then he says this in verse 25. He says, now, my sheep, what do they do? They listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them from my hand. That is powerful. It is profound. It is a massive state. He says previously that I am the good shepherd, and I want you to know that if you are my sheep, you will indeed listen to my voice. The question is not if Jesus is speaking. The question is, are we listening? You hear me? He always is speaking. He speaks through His written Word. He infuses it with His Holy Spirit. He calls us to Himself. Do you hear His voice? And are you known by Him? Known by Him. Opening up your life, opening up your mind, opening up your spirit, opening up the totality of your existence to Christ. Not holding anything back, not hiding any flaw, but completely being known by Him. And when you do, you will be completely and utterly loved by Him. Hiding, not wandering, but saying, I hear you, I know you, you know me, and they follow him. A hallmark or a sign that people are Christians is if they are following Christ. Not a preacher, but the Christ following <laughs> These things matter, and there's a promise that if we are his sheep, he says, I will give them eternal life. That's good news. They will never perish, and I love this, no one will snatch them out of his hand. Right? 
no one. And Jesus declares this, saying, if you are my sheep, no one and no thing is going to take you away from me because you are mine and I am yours. These are powerful words. Do we listen to his voice? Do you follow Jesus? Do you do what he says? Are you going where he leads? Does he know He says he will hold you fast. Are you clinging to him? Is Jesus on your margin or Jesus your middle? We have to ask this question. And Jesus declared in this passage, in this context of those who literally wanted to kill him, He says, you don't believe because you're not my sheep, but if you are my sheep, you will hear my voice, and if you hear my voice, I will give you eternal life, and nothing will take you away from me, because I am the good shepherd. Significant statements that we have to ask ourselves. Where are we in relation relation to this man? Now, Jesus goes on, and he is driving home these points, and John the Apostle is driving home these points by the power of the Holy Spirit, saying next, Jesus and the Father are one, and this is a significant statement. Jesus goes on and describing himself as a good shepherd and describing sheep that are his and sheep that are not his, and then he says this, my Father, verse 29, who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. I want us to understand the significance of this statement. Jesus said that God the Father, right, the creator of all things, has given people in his hand. And if people are in the Father's hand, they're in Jesus' hand. If they're in Jesus' hand, they're in the Father's hand because they are one. He is claiming divinity. He is claiming oneness with the Father. Now, the Father and Son are one in substance, one in purpose. As the Nicene Creed says, very God of very God. This is what Jesus was saying. He claimed to be God. He claimed this time and time again. And we've seen it as we've been working up to chapter 10. Where he says, before Abraham was, I am. He said that he was the light of the world, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He claimed these things, and when he said, I and the Father are one, he was claiming divinity. And those who had listened, were listening to them, those who were steeped in the Old Testament scriptures, he knew exactly what he was saying. Verse 31, when they heard this, this is how these people who were listening to him responded. Again, his Jewish opponents, they picked up stones to stone him. And Jesus said to them, hey, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? They responded, verse 33, we're not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, Claim to be God. And those who were listening to him were 
wrong and they were right. They are wrong because this was no mere man. But they were right because he indeed claimed to be God. And they took issue with this. Why? Because they did not believe. And many people since then have taken issue with these statements. Literally billion of people. Orthodox Jews to this day refute Jesus' claim of divinity. Those who adhere to Islam They do not believe that Jesus is God. Those who cling to religions like Hinduism or Buddhism don't believe that Jesus is God. Of course, atheists don't believe it. Gnostics don't believe it. And many in this country, if they are not of those persuasions, they say they're quote-unquote spiritual, right? They believe, perhaps, Jesus is a good person, but they don't understand what he claimed. People believe in completely many things about Jesus, that he was a, quote, good teacher, that he was an enlightened one, or he is, you know, a great example. Most people would say these things. But he said that he is God. He said that he is the creator. He says he is the author of life. He says he is the judge, the redeemer, the savior the Lord. He says he is the sovereign. He says that he is the greater temple, the greater prophet, the greater king, the great I am. He said he was way more than what people claim him to be. One of the books that helped me to give myself fully, completely over to Christ when I was a senior in high school, the book you may have heard of, it's called Mere Christianity. Anyone hear of that book? C.S. Lewis. Right? By the grace of God, I was able to read that book as I was trying to determine what is ultimately true. If you don't know C.S. Lewis, he was, <clears throat> excuse me, an atheist, very smart individual, who God, in a series of events, continued to pursue him. And he had to deal with the question that I'm asking all of us to deal with. Who is Jesus Christ truly as revealed in Scripture? And so he investigated, he looked, he did his homework, and this is what he concluded. Now hear these words well, and I should have them up here, okay? One paragraph, he says this in Mere Christianity. Now he says, now I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing, that people often say about him, which is Christ. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. Now, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said wouldn't be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg. 
or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You could spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. And he did not intend to. Now, it seems to me obvious that he was either a lunatic, uh, he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. C.S. Lewis called himself the most unlikely convert. He wanted to know the truth. And if people call Jesus just a moral teacher, they haven't read the Gospels. I hope they're just ignorant. And I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to understand what Jesus claimed. He's either crazy or we are deceived by an evil spirit or indeed he is God. Make your choice as to what you will believe. This is what Scripture calls us to My hope is that if you are here and you are considering Christ, that you will choose to believe based upon what he claimed he was, what he actually did, what he taught, his resurrection and all that comes from it. Do business with him. And some of you, I'm sure, are in that camp today. But most of you in this room, <laughs> you already believe he's the Son of God. Are you listening to his voice? Well, I don't got time because the Packers are playing. Jesus is supposed to listen to my voice. No, you're supposed to listen to his. Do you hear do you hear me? Please hear me. Please hear me. Do you believe he's God? Then follow him. What else is more important? Well, I think I know a little bit more than Jesus does. <laughs> you guys are hilarious. You never say that, but your actions will say that. I'm just going to let that sit there. We're just going to simmer that. He is, he's the only thing that really matters. And if he's not God, then nothing matters. Make your choice. Jesus puts all these things out there. These people want to kill him. 
and he says he is the Son of God. Remember this context. Let's go back to the text here. Saying these things, you want to kill him, they understand what he's saying. Then Jesus goes then back to Scripture to defend his statement. So it gets a little technical, but stay with me. Verse 34, John chapter 10. Jesus answers them, Is it not written in your law? I've said you are God's small g gods. If he calls them gods, that is the writer of the psalm we're going to look at, to whom the word of God came, and Scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set apart, you see, set aside, set apart, as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am God's son? What is going on here? This, by the way, is Psalm 82. Okay. Psalm 82, Jesus is quoting this. It's a very, very interesting psalm. A lot going on, first part and second part. Second part, it says this. This is Psalm 82, 6. This is what Jesus was quoting. I said, you are God's, small g, sons of the Most High, all of you. Now, this portion of this psalm was pointing to the children of Israel, to whom the word of God came. These are the gathered tribes of Israel were gathered around Mount Sinai in which God's word came to Moses and then came to them, making them carriers of God's word, which made them, quote-unquote, little gods, right? Having the Word of God. And they became um, sons of God because they carried the Word of God. So in that context, they were sons of the Most High. So Jesus was saying in that context, so if God the Father calls, called those <coughs> with the Word of God, gods and sons of God, how much more is Jesus? <clears throat> whom the Father set apart as His very own and set into the world. So He's saying, listen, if you um, carry God's Word given to you through Moses to you, and God says, hey, you are my children, you are quote-unquote little gods in the sense of carrying God's Word, how much more am I? Because the Father set me apart if he gave you the word of God, he's saying, I am the word of God. And if you are, quote unquote, small sons of small g God, he says, I'm much more. I am the son of God. I am the word of God. I am the one who was set apart for a special purpose, just like you set this tabernacle apart for a special purpose. I am the fulfillment of that. I am much more. And he says, you shouldn't be surprised by this. <clears throat> John, make it clear in the beginning that Jesus was the word that become flesh. And he's saying, it's in your scripture, I am the ultimate fulfillment of this, you should not be surprised. I am the one who God has set apart. I am God, I am one with the Father. And Jesus says, if you don't believe my words, then at least take note of what I've been doing as evidence that I've been telling you the truth about Myself. He goes on in verse 37. <clears throat> do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Just like some are saying, can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And we know up to this point in reading in this gospel all the things that Jesus has been doing including knowing people's pasts, including knowing what's in the future. 
including speaking with authority to the authorities, including casting out demons, including speaking a word and diseases were cured, including taking water and recreating it into something different, wine, including multiplying loaves and fishes for thousands of people, including walking on the water, including healing a paralytic who had been sick his entire life into his 30s and beyond, including opening the eyes of the blind, and we'll read just in the next chapter, including raising people from the dead. He was only doing what God himself would do. We've seen this in these passages, bringing back time after time after time, Old Testament, Old Testament prophecies that say that only God can do this. Jesus fulfilled these things. So if you don't believe my claims, at least understand what I'm saying and what I do that point to, give testimony of what I say I am. And no matter what Jesus did, and no matter what even Jesus does today, there'd be some people who won't hear it. Verse 39 again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. People do not try to kill great examples and great moral teachers. They understood what he was claiming, that he indeed was God. This passage concludes, and I'll conclude with this as well, going all the way back to John the Baptist. If you remember this, all the way from the front of this gospel, John the Baptist was on the scene. Jesus went back now to this area. And there's a turn we'll see as we continue going forward in this gospel. Verse 40. And Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed. And many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man it's true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. Do you remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus? Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. John said, the one who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. That Jesus is God's chosen one. They never saw a sign. John never performed a miracle. He spoke God's word and people believe. Will you believe even if you never see a miracle? Will you believe on the merits of his word, what he did? Will you believe? Many in this place believed, and I would hope that many in this place will believe. So we must make up our minds about Jesus. Don't be a fool and say he was just a moral teacher. If you come and tell me this, I will be unpleased. <laughs> not that it's about me, because it's not. If you asked your family who Jesus was, right, when together, whenever you get together, what, what are you going to hear? If they don't understand what Jesus claimed, you have opportunity then to say these things. So this is how we're going to end. <clears throat> Again, two categories. 
One, you say, yeah, I'm not sure, and maybe you're still deciding. I say, investigate. You go back and you read the gospel. Read the gospel of John. Read it through. Maybe you're here. You say, you know what? I hear his voice and I believe. Then make that decision. I will pray with you. We will see you follow Christ and obey him. I hope today you make that decision that you hear his voice. That's probably a minority of people in here. To the rest of us, you're like, amen, pastor, I believe it, preach it. I'm talking to you, friend. How is your hearing? Oh, I know Jesus is out there, but I'm over here chomping on these weeds. I think, he's, I, I think that's him. Hey, if you're like Roman, run back to your Savior. Do you hear me? The safest place for you is right beside the Good Shepherd. Yeah. Come on. Are you listening to his voice? When I say that, hey, do you read your Bible? God's voice speaks through. His sheep listen to his voice. Get close to him. He's the one in which gave his life for you. He's the one in which he will give an account to. He's the one who loves you, will take care of you. He is strong. So get close. Right? Get close to him. So I'm going to pray for us. We're going to conclude with one of my favorite songs, He Will Hold Me Fast. And I want you to take that to heart as well. So let's pray. <clears throat> Jesus, um, you know who your sheep are and who aren't. My hope is that every person hearing your word today from Scripture, God, would respond. God, I pray for my friends, for those who are considering Christ. Maybe they came in here, you know, thinking, hey, I'll go to church because my mom thinks it's a good idea or... I got a friend here, or they have really good donuts, right? <laughs> God, I ask that people get much more than donuts today. Yeah. Give us ears to hear, Jesus, right? Way beyond anything I say, Lord. But what you're saying, help us to deal with these things truthfully. Draw people to yourself. Lord, we're, we're looking to lift you up. So when we lift you up, you will draw all people to yourself. So be glorified, Jesus. God, I'm so grateful for so many in here who have faithfully followed you their whole life, who continue to persevere, God. And I can name names so grateful. Strengthen them. Encourage them. From rest and knowing that their salvation is assured because you hold us fast. Let us rejoice in that. Those others who say, yeah, I believe Jesus is the Lord and wandering or not listening, God, I ask that you would open our ears, open our eyes, that we draw close to you as you seek us. May we love you and follow you and walk with you till we see you face to face. We give you praise, Lord Jesus. We love you. We 
do. We thank you for your goodness to us. You are indeed our great shepherd, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.